okay, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want to build on this morning's message by focusing on uh, this concept of ye are Christ's. This morning I talked to, to you about what was more important than anything else in my life is the time that I spent alone with the Lord. Now in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, I'm in 2 Corinthians, uh, the third chapter deals with the judgment seat of Christ, but it also covers more than that, and that's what I want to focus on uh, for this message. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and look all the way to the end at verse 23, that's our text, and ye are Christ's and Christ is God's. A principle is taught in that which is almost always overlooked, and I want to share it with you before we get to the end of the message. Paul, writing to Corinth, told them, he says, and you're Christ, ye are Christ. But then he says, and Christ is God's, and that kind of throws us a little bit. But this is in a larger context. The larger context is the third chapter, and the context that's next largest to that would be the whole book of uh, 1 Corinthians. But we're only going to look at the third chapter tonight. And I want to give you kind of a summary of what Paul is saying before he gets to that statement. So 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, Paul reprimands the church in its immaturity because the immaturity has led them to carnality, which is all of the sinful things they were doing were the result of their immaturity. They've been saved since his second missionary journey. And they should have by this time grown spiritually. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. That is not a compliment. <laughs> They've been saved a long time. And then if you move over to verses 4 through 9... Um, chapter 3 verses 4 through 9 notice what he says here for while one saith I am of Paul and another I am of Apollos are you not yet carnal later he refers to Cephas as well it seems that the people in the Corinthian church were developing their favorites that's a big thing today I go to a conference sometime and somebody will ask me Brother Goodell, whose camp are you in? And I said, whose camp am I in? Yeah, are you Robertson or Hiles or Falwell? Whose camp are you in? And I said, I take that Old Testament passage, which is quoted in the New Testament, and uh, they went without the camp. And so I said, I don't belong to any camp, you know. I don't have any, I've got some great people that influence my life, but I don't follow them. I follow the Christ that they preached. So Paul expresses their favoritism here as an you know, immaturity. In verse 9, he tells them that each leader is a member of a larger team run by God. None of them are supposed to be favored heroes for the immature. And then verses 10 and 11, Paul reminds them in construction terminology that Jesus is the one foundation of their lives. He then tells them that each of them will be held accountable for constructing his life on that foundation. Look at verses 10 and 11. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another man buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Well, some religions believe that the church is built on someone else, you know, but uh, the Bible's pretty clear about this. This is the one foundation. By the way, uh, Paul, in reminding them about their construction terminology and the one foundation of their life, he then tells them that each of them will be held accountable for the superstructure that he builds on that foundation. Now, if you remember some of the things that we looked at in the, uh, in the series that I did on uh, uh, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Maybe the Apostle Paul had this closing passage that Jesus used 
when he finished out chapter 7 of Matthew. Listen to it. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And if we put those two together, we find out what it means to build our lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ. It means to take everything that he taught and integrate it into our lives, and that is the foundation. Uh, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16 through 23. And in those verses, 16 through 23, he does three things. He reminds them that they are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, verses 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And then he emphasizes the emptiness, the emptiness of worldly wisdom, verses 18 through 20. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. And then he reminds them of their specific relationship to Jesus Christ in verses 21 through 23. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and ye are Christ's and Christ is God's. So this is a permanent relationship that he's talking about here based upon the finished work of Christ, which can't be reversed. And it's based upon what he did at the cross, based upon his resurrection and encompasses, according to the apostle here, unlimited benefits. He says, for all things are yours. He said, everything is yours. You have infinite resources in him. I really enjoyed Charles Spurgeon's description of this statement, and ye are Christ's. Listen to what he says. This is January 12th in the morning section. He says, Ye are Christ's, you are his by donation, for the Father gave you to the Son. You are his by his bloody purchase, for he counted down the price for your redemption. You are his by dedication, for you have consecrated yourself to him. And you are his by relation, for you were named by his name and made one with his brethren and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, end of quotation. So when Paul told the Corinthians to clean house, basically you could put the word clean house over 1 Corinthians and clean house over 2 Corinthians. Paul never wrote as much about the negative things happening in a church as he did to the Corinthian church. They had gone back into idolatry. They were allowing incest to go on in the church without being punished. They were critical and fault-finding and they were undermining and they were choosing leaders and putting one leader over another. They were a mess. So Paul told them to clean house. And he started, he's, what he's saying there is, he, why don't you start acting like ye are Christ? Start acting like ye are Christ. He was reminding them of their permanently established relationship to Christ. He said that relationship demands from you the maximum of your Christian living. Now, we could use this admonition today, couldn't we? And some people tell me, well, I watch so-and-so. I don't go to church. I watch so-and-so on TV. Well, I like such-and-such -such better than I do so-and-so because he's more attractive. You, know, you get all these things about 
these uh, so-called great leaders. And uh, he, Paul says, look, he says, we should use this admonition in his day and we should use it today. A lot of churches today refuse to deal with sin within the church because they don't want to be considered by the world as unloving. Today, everybody talks about, well, we need to be more loving. And they have absolutely no concept of what love is. They don't. They really don't. The truly unloving churches are the ones who will not deal with sin among its membership. Just like a parent who will not discipline his child's misbehavior, he doesn't really love his child no matter how loudly he protests that he loves his children. You cannot say, I love my children and I won't discipline them. You can't say that. In God's word, biblical love is really an accountability concept. The Old Testament prophets preached against the sin of the leaders in the country and they penalized sin and God even called them to announce judgment on those who were the people of God. You heard Pastor Jebo's messages on Habakkuk. Habakkuk couldn't believe that God was going to use Nebuchadnezzar, the most wicked leader among pagans, to discipline the holy people of God. He just couldn't believe it would happen. But it did happen. Old Testament prophets preached against it. Jesus, by the way, preached against sin. And Jesus even penalized sin. And the New Testament apostles were called of God to judge the churches when they were out of line. So those who reject God's tough love, <laughs> those who reject God's tough love are only operating out of carnal sentiment. They're not operating out of biblical love. So when our actions spring from immature and carnal uh, sentimentality, we ought not take the attitude that we're operating in biblical love. It just isn't happening. God's love is not sentimental. Only the immature practice sentimentality. So Paul says, ye are Christ's. Now when he makes that statement, there are several things that are implied. I mean, it's only three words. Ye are Christ's. But man, let me show you what's implied by the statement. Number one, it tells about our status. It tells about our status. Spurgeon said, He counted down the price for your redemption, and that was paid out of his shed blood at Calvary. Jesus himself declared the permanence of this purchase in John 10, 28. Listen to what he said. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And Paul reminded those in the Corinthian church when he said, Dear Christ, he was admonishing them to start behaving in accordance with their status. They had a very high status. Well, but year Christ also tells us of something else. Number two, it tells us about our accountability. It tells us about our accountability. When someone can give or withhold rewards for behavior, you are accountable to that person. That person is in an authoritative position to hold you accountable and uh, to give you whatever deserts you have or whatever penalties you deserve for disobedience. 1 Corinthians 3 passage seems to place Christ in the position to hold each of us accountable to himself in a final appearance at the judgment seat of Christ. Now distinguish between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. If you've been born again, you won't be at the great white throne judgment. Everybody there is going to hell. But if you've been born again, you will appear at the judgment seat of Christ. And I don't understand all the little details associated with this rewards and withholding rewards and all of that. I just know that we're going to be held accountable. So I just need to be ready for that. Never doubt as a Christian that you will not be held accountable for how you live. Never doubt as a Christian that you will not be held accountable for what kind of superstructure 
You build on that one foundation that Paul talked about, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So when Paul wrote the Corinthians, and when he said, you're Christ, he was reminding them, number one, of their secure status in Christ. Number two, of their future accountability for how they live now. But there's something else implied, too, in the statement, ye are Christ. Number three, it tells about our responsibility. Paul even warned believers in the church in Rome. He said in Romans 14, 10 through 12, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You see, our responsibility as God sets it out will be evaluated as to how well we carried it out. Let me say that again. Our responsibility as God sets it out will be evaluated as to how well we carried it out. We're responsible for how we live, but also how we treat others in the body of Christ. A lot is said uh, in the Bible. You want an interesting study. I wanted to preach a series and never got around to it on the use of the word one another in the Bible um, or another, that sort of thing. Very powerful. Just go through. If you got a, if you got a concordance, you just look up one another and Go to every place that mentions it. Listen to this. Romans 12, 5. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one member one of another. Every saved person has an obligation to every other saved person. In the local church, this is particularly true. Paul tells believers at Romans, at Rome in 12, 10, he says, being kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. And then Paul encourages them to think alike toward one another. Be of the same mind one toward another, Romans 12, 16. This prevents unfavorable comparisons between people in the church. In Romans 13, 8, he says, to love one another. In 14, 13, he says that they are to avoid a judgmental attitude one toward another. He's not saying no judgment should take place. What he's talking about there is needless criticism of somebody you disagree with. This verse encourages us that we can prevent stumbling in the lives of others by our own personal conduct. In Romans 14, 19, Paul tells us we have the responsibility to make peace and to edify one another, build each other up, help with that superstructure your, your fellow Christian is building on that foundation. And maybe that man will come around later and have to help you with your superstructure that you're building on that foundation. There are many references in the book of Romans and the other letters of the Apostle Paul as well, Ephesians is a big one, to our responsibilities toward one another in the one body of Christ. One reference in Romans, I think, encourages loving rebuke of one another. When you love people, that doesn't mean you don't confront them on their sin. Doesn't mean you don't rebuke them, but it does affect your attitude when you do the rebuke. Listen to what he said. Romans 15, 14. He says, and we are able to admonish one another. And uh, that's a very important verse. Remember this. We're talking now about Paul's statement to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 3.23. Ye are Christ. And we're asking and answering questions as to what does that really mean. First of all, we said it tells of our status. We are purchased by him. And because of that, we are not our own. We belong to him. Secondly, it tells us about our accountability. We are accountable now, but we will ultimately be held accountable when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And then thirdly, it tells about our responsibilities that as members of the one body, what he calls the church, we are responsible for all believers within the church. None of us is an island unto himself. Well, let me give you number four. This is the last one. 
and then you'll get out early tonight. <clears throat> Number four, it tells us about our resources. It tells us about our resources. As joint heirs with Christ, we have everything he has. 1 Corinthians 3.22 says, Things present, things to come, all are yours. And Paul was combating what I think was the wrong attitude of competition between church members within the church at Corinth. I don't think anything can be as dastardly in destroying a church as people running around thinking they're better than somebody else in the church and comparing themselves and using those unfavorable comparisons against others. And then those people who actually believe those unfavorable comparisons begin to put themselves down when they have no reason to do so. Paul was combating the wrong attitude of competition between members in the church at Corinth. He says in 1 Corinthians 3.22, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, meaning Peter, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, that covers it all, right? He says, all are yours because you are joint heirs with Christ. Then he tells them why. And ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. And there's an important principle I th told you I was going to give to you at the end of the message, verse 23. You don't want to miss this point. Very crucial point. Just as there is no division in the Godhead. Think about that. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're all co-equal. If you talk about the Holy Spirit, you're talking about God. Talking about Jesus Christ, you're talking about God. Talking about the Father, you're talking about God. Take that, you Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, and what I'm saying here is what, what he's talking about is you can have individuality and you can have that individuality without division. Or maybe I should say without divisiveness. So just as there is no division in the Godhead, Christ is God's, what he's saying here is is there should be no division based on competitiveness between the members and the body of Christ. Boy, that's a powerful principle, isn't it? A lot of people get the idea because I stand up here and preach to you every week, I'm more important than you are. Nothing could be further from the truth. God doesn't rate us that way. What God does is he evaluates us based upon what natural skills we have and then what spiritual gifts get come to us when the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, and then how we carry that out through the rest of our Christian life. Just because your spiritual skill might be giving, and my spiritual skill might be teaching in front of the congregation, that has nothing to do with our importance. In Jesus Christ, we're all equal, we're all important, we're all redeemed by the same blood. We all came to the foot of the same cross and we all touch the heart of the one who walked out of the empty tomb. So we're one body, purchased by the one blood of Christ, all for one holy purpose. And what is that holy purpose? Paul says it over and over again, to glorify God. Nothing glorifies God in the community of lost people than a church with a sweet spirit where the people get along with each other, build each other up, encourage each other, rebuke if necessary with the right attitude, that glorifies God. Warren Wiersbe, one of my teachers from the years gone by, wrote the Bible exposition commentary and uh, in the New Testament, volume one, page 581, he gives what I call a, a great summary to this passage of scripture. Listen to it. Ye are Christ. This balances things. I have all things in Jesus Christ, but I, not, I must not become careless or use my freedom unwisely. All things are yours, Paul says. That is Christian liberty. And then he says, and ye are Christ. That is Christian responsibility. We need both of those if we're going to build a church that will not be turned to ashes 
when the fire of God falls. Isn't that a powerful statement? Well, I don't know about you, but I really like the spirit in our church. You know, God's blessed us immensely, and we should be grateful for that. Let's stand together for prayer. Lord, we come to you now asking that you'll speak to our hearts. If anyone needs to come to the altar, may this be the moment. And then we ask you also, dear Lord, to uh, take these words in principle tonight and, uh, uh, and carve them, engrave them upon our minds and hearts that we will apply these principles to the way we live. So speak to our hearts now, we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen.